the way from New York, Sasha is Sogdian numismatics, a topic his name is synonymous with. Uh, that's not the first time I'm speaking about immobilized coinage uh, in Sogdian uh, numismatics. Uh, but every time uh, there's something different because there's so many different types uh, that I mobilized and so many different aspects of the problem that actually every time there's something new to say. Today we'll concentrate on a couple of things which I thought might be of general interest. I may be mistaken, of course. Well, to remind everybody that Sogdiana is uh, situated in Central Asia. Well, Central Asia is here, Western Central Asia. Uh, Sogdiana is um, here, approximately. So that is more than map. So it's mostly Uzbekistan with some parts of Tajikistan. And that is uh, really the situation on the ground uh, in antiquity, where Sogd is uh, well of two rivers. To the north of it, in the area of Tashkent, the two oases um, kind of united into one block of land is Chach. Further in the east is Fergana Valley, and to the south is Taharistan or Bactria. Well, uh, in uh, the third century BC, Sogdiana, around 230 BC, uh, made itself independent from Greeks of Bactria. Uh, that can be proved uh, with a uh, relatively precise numismatic evidence. Uh, and uh, then uh, local coinage started. Uh, originally, there were four minting centers. And then uh, one of those, which was Samarkand, uh, strangely enough, uh, minted imitations, but in three denominations. That's quite an unusual case. But it's absolutely uh, undoubtful. That's an old plate, uh, which I'm going to show of this situation. These are drachms, hemi drachms, and abols. And then uh, uh, there was something that I call uh, Indiochus imitations middle stage, uh, which actually, well, uh, um, this is all documented also with fines uh, we have now. I collected about 400 of Antiochus imitations by now. There are uh, significant numbers already of with known uh, places of finds. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, middle stage, uh, which actually can be dated because suddenly they introduced a portrait of the type uh, which appears in local numismatics, meaning Krakobactrian and, and so on, at the time of Eucratides, um, well, whatever you call it, Eucratides II. And then around the year 50 BC, well, uh, something like this, it started uh, uh, dividing, well, this coinage kind of divides into three branches. Well, or let's say three different mints pick up this design. Uh, one mint is uh, obviously in Samarkand, uh, another mint to the west of Samarkand, and the third one uh, is actually um, uh, he um, here in uh, uh, the west, to the west. Uh, that's how they distribute. Uh, originally, there were only two, then they divided, the second series divided into two lines. And uh, uh, for, in the first century, the Sogdian, Sogdian coinage looks like this. It's, in fact, it's already outdated uh, during the last year. It became clear that there's one more series, a uh, series which I uh, knew earlier but uh, which now, due to uh, the uh, number of precise finds, uh, uh, find places uh, uh, can be also uh, placed uh, here in this area, uh, this series. Uh, uh, it's actually now fairly numerous. We have over 30 coins. Uh, altogether, that's plate, which is slightly out of date. And then line two of, of this, multiple lines, uh, obviously is uh, connected to the Western sword because it starts turning into Hercules coinage. Uh, about a year ago, uh, uh, I was still looking at uh, plates like this and uh, was thinking that, well, it started with, in, in, the, in the first half of the first century BC, it was coinage like this with um, blank uh, overs then the same was inherited by this line too. And then this starts appearing a portrait of Hercules. But I thought that that was an interesting process because 
for a while they kept the Antiochus imitations uh, reverses. I thought that they were still using old dyes, let's put it this way, uh, that they had a number of dyes which they uh, simply utilized when they uh, were finished with this dyes. Uh, these are upper dyes, please note, in this case. They uh, actually uh, introduced a new Hercotis dye. While obvious, they already, by that time, uh, they produce the Hercotis, they slowly develop the portrait, that is the early stage, which looks like one of famous Russian actors. Uh, but then uh, they ended up with uh, a standard Hercotis portrait. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, with some more finds, and uh, some more coins and a little bit of work, it turns out that it's not uh, uh, a correct assumption because this was the initial stage and we have very particular reverses, then this reverses and then specifically this reverses are never met at the Antiochus imitation dies. In other words, they kept producing new incredibly ugly dyes where you barely can recognize the image uh, as, a, as a horse. Uh, well, at this lower level, it's, uh, I find it hard to describe what is depicted. Um, something absolutely comprehensible. They kept reproducing, they kept producing the dyes with this uh, um, completely distorted image uh, simultaneously with having absolutely perfect portrait and absolutely perfect inscription, Irkotis, on the uh, obverse. Which makes me think uh, once more that the main criterion by which imitations were kept on the market was simply recognizability of the die. In other words, it was absolutely essential for people who introduced new portrait of your quarters to keep for a while the reverse, which would be recognized on the market. That is the only explanation that I can offer so far. Uh, and uh, that is uh, something uh, I think um, which um, explains uh, an interesting situation. Uh, imitations tend to imitate the coins which are taken off the pool of circulating coins on the market. It would be quite easy to go back to original prototypes, which were probably still available or earlier prototypes. And yet they actually reproduce something that is constantly circulating on the market. In other words, that facilitates the process of distortion because they don't go to the originals ever. And uh, uh, that explains how the, uh, well, it explains the logic behind the uh, imitational coinage in many uh, cases. Uh, well, uh, that is what is happening further with headquarters. Uh, that is happening around the beginning of our era. I, I'm um, not sure uh, about the exact decade, uh, but it can be maybe 10 BC or 10 or 15 Anna Domini. Uh, interestingly, that uh, uh, it is, I believe, interesting that this portrait uh, predates Herai's portrait, which was immensely important uh, in um, the development of Kushan official iconography. And that probably was the first portrait of a nomadic ruler with very non-Greek features, with this cranial deformation of the head, um, very obvious, um, um, and, and so on. Uh, and what is interesting also, uh, last thing to say about Hercules, is that eventually when the horse is improved and uh, a perfect reverse is introduced, at the same time, uh, they introduce larger denomination. This stays at the level of hemidrachm, uh, and that is uh, something very close to a drachm. Well, the earliest I know weighs 4.04, 4, 4, 4, uh, 4 um, uh, gram, 
uh, and it's already probably slightly removed from uh, the uh, initial point. Uh, so, uh, and what is interesting that this uh, type with a so-called soldier, in reality, originally it was the image of God's Rosh, who uh, in fact uh, has fire coming out of his shoulders, standing with a, with a fire uh, in his uh, hand and also uh, having chicken legs and chicken and the rooster tail. Uh, these coins uh, have a long history, uh, in fact, and um, uh, they go into the third century Anno Domini uh, and um, uh, they deteriorate the last coins in this row, I wasn't able to show them in their real size. They're only 0 0.6, no, 0 0.6 centimeter large, They're absolutely tiny. And all that's left of poor Herpotus is this, and of uh, the Srosh is here. But what is interesting, there's nothing changing. There are no new types. It's just endless 300 or years of deterioration. Meanwhile, the smaller denomination actually has new uh, names introduced on the coins. We have here three different uh, names uh, introduced uh, in Sogdian instead of original Greek inscriptions. And uh, uh, that is also quite remarkable. It's very obvious that the larger denomination, which probably had broader circulation and was circulating beyond the borders of small principality of Harkana, where most likely Hercules coins were uh, produced, uh, it stayed unchanged for 300 years. While small denomination actually um, reflected some political changes within the, uh, this little kingdom, this little realm. Well, the coins with new inscriptions, um, each uh, inscription takes one row. Uh, the last one known only in one specimen says Tur, but uh, I don't know what is further. It's not full name, uh, part of it is preserved. And uh, uh, that is uh, the case which I was interested in discussing with early stuff. There's something else uh, which I think is interesting from later period, and uh, uh, that is once more Sogdiana, uh, that is situation uh, with the uh, Kushana Sasanian period when um, actually I, I think I jumped one thing. That is Sogdiana and Kushan period uh, with Kushan border, that is Kushana Sasanian period where um, um, part of Sogdiana was incorporated into Kushana Sasanian domain. Uh, well, Bukhara for sure was kept for about 100 years by Kushana Sasanians. And uh, uh, that is the general situation once more. Uh, and I didn't dare to draw any heftalite borders in Central Asia because we really don't know what is there. And anything uh, precise would be uh, simply uh, a wild guess. What we know, however, that uh, Heftalite realm included most of Sogdiana, or maybe all Sogdiana, for quite uh, a time, and uh, the church was also probably incorporated. Uh, there's no evidence for Bukhara, uh, for Fergana whatsoever. So, uh, and uh, um, then uh, I would like to note something, would, would, would claim something quite unusual, that oh, during the Heftalite period, there's no introduction of new types on the entire, the entire territory of Sogdiana and Chach. This is what's happening in Bukhara. Uh, we have two lines, I would say, of uh, imitations, copper. Original coins were issued by Hwab Azbar. And then until middle of the sixth century, probably, or something like this, we have uh, complete deterioration in these two lines. How these two lines are divided, I don't know whether it's chronological division or um, uh, territorial. I can't yet say because these coins are found in hundreds and um, it's um, um, very broadly uh, and uh, uh, there's absolutely no um, possibility of uh, such thing. And then this is what is minted once more for a very long time, uh, um, covering not only a heftalite, but also earlier period, 
partially uh, in uh, Nakhchev and uh, Kesh, both this probably was this uh, was one political unit at that time. Uh, and uh, that is what is minted in Samarkand. Um, well, uh, there are 13 stages, but uh, starting with this one, which says Kidara, uh, and going into uh, uh, this one, which actually says nothing really, uh, 13 stage. Uh, it's also uh, mostly imitational. Uh, after Kidara, we really have uh, uh, just reproduction. There's one more series which has uh, one uh, new inscription right after that. And then we have uh, reproduction of uh, the same type and the same inscription uh, with, uh, well, kind of individual variations for series, uh, dictated probably by the skills of the uh, die carvers. Uh, and then that is copper that is minted at that time. Uh, one side is absolutely blind. Uh, the other side has this de uh, design, which is uh, uh, which uh, is changing. Uh, it's uh, quite a long story to explain what actually is happening. But what I uh, once more would like to uh, draw attention to. Uh, yes, and this is the last thing. This is Chach. And uh, Chach also started in the early 5th century with wonderful, beautiful coins like this, with uh, beautiful Sogdian inscriptions. But then eventually these inscriptions, well, for, for some time they're maintained, and then eventually they are completely distorted. And uh, for 100 years during the light period, there's nothing. So it looks like that uh, heftalites uh, uh, during the heftalite period, both copper and silver are produced in uh, this imitational mode. Uh, and uh, that is kind of strange. Uh, well, I wanted to draw attention to something that is happening in the fifth century Marv uh, in uh, uh, heftalite period. That at certain point, Varakran imitations produced in very large numbers. Well, this is silver Varakran imitations. Uh, that is uh, just uh, a local Marv one. This one is already with a Sogdian uh, Bukharan countermark. But what is strange, uh, there's a particular way of distortion of the legend, very recognizable. What is crazy, is that this is a gold dinar, which doesn't have the same inscription on the others. But please look at the legend. They introduced the same distorted legend from silver coins to a gold dinar. It's very obvious imitation. Well, it's usually a very specific face which uh, characterizes these imitations. And uh, uh, that looks uh, as uh, intentional reproductional blundering, blundered legend on a, a different type, on a gold type. Looks like uh, they were intentionally avoiding any sensible inscriptions. In the inscriptions, well, were, they felt that they actually should look uh, uh, in a very specific way. Uh, this blunder inscriptions, and uh, it looks like that this was kind of a signature. But it's a signature which does not include any identification of the power that issued this coin. I think it's very strange. Uh, well, almost as strange as um, Nikolaus Schindel's, uh, my good friend Nikolaus Schindel's, claim that. Uh, imitations like this, actually the original coins and the original coins with good Sasani and Pahlavi inscriptions are actually imitations, right? But what is interesting about it is that uh, this uh, uh, somehow resonates with the situation when during the Heftalite period, there are absolutely no new types in Sogdiana. It looks like Heftalites are suppressing intentionally any expression of local identity on coins. What is interesting also, that after Heftalites firmly entrenched and sold, and according to Anarchy Kadzuya, that happens in 506 only, uh, uh, 
and the Domini, uh, since that moment, the no embassies from Sogdian principalities to China until the end of Heftalite rule. We see only embassies from Yeda, from Heftalites. And this, is, this would be another form of suppression of local identity, because we know that embassies were mainly trade expeditions, which merchants organized and which were coming every year to China. And uh, 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 they were always claiming their, uh, their, the, the ambassadorial status of um, uh, their own principalities. In this case, Sogdian uh, embassies disappear, Samarkand embassies in particular disappear, and instead we have embassies of Yeda. So that is another form of suppression of local identity. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. What I know is that uh, uh, these uh, cases are very strange, both case with your quarters and uh, this case. And I thought that it might be interesting to, well, present them in, I would say, somewhat more generalized form to a public which may say something about this and maybe correct me in my crazy assumptions. I guess I'll finish at this point. Thank you very much for your patience. And that's uh, how it is on Brighton Beach. Mm -hmm.